Good morning and welcome here. I hope that you will be really blessed by today. I believe that the word of the Lord is going to give you a specific blessing today because there is going to be quite a lot of teaching. But this is the word that the Lord has given me for this week. And I hope that you will be blessed. So let us come to the Lord in prayer as we close our eyes. Thank you. Father God, Father, thank you for the word and the work that you have done within us, Lord. And we ask, Father God, that you will lead us through your word and your Holy Spirit, and that you will empower us today with your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for walking this life with us. You have promised that together, hand in hand, we will walk home into eternity. And so today, Father God, we prepare ourselves to receive your word. And we ask that you will enable us and empower us so that this word today might transform our thinkings and our lives. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, I'm not a singer, as you well know, but me and Ian is going to lead you through a song right now. Thank you very much. You hold my every moment, call my agencies. You walk with me the fire and feel all my disease. I just.
So yes, today our Bible reading is out of Acts and it is Acts 8. And we are going to look at the deception in the church and how to deal with things like that within our lives. So it is Acts 8 and I'm reading from verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things according concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. May the Lord add his blessing to this word. Amen. Quite an interesting um, reading today. Now, in the book of Acts, we see that there was great, a great persecution that took place. And we see in the book of Acts that people were just scattered everywhere. And we know that before the great persecution, Jesus told people that they were to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But you know what? Instead of spreading out, they just huddled together. And so God raised up persecution by which he commission, by which his commission would be fulfilled. In other words, if the apostles will not fulfill Acts 1 verse 8, then God will fulfill Acts 1 verse 8. Because in the final analysis, 
Jerusalem is not the headquarters of the Christian church. Heaven is the headquarters of the Christian church. So God will work from heaven. And at this point then in time in the book of Acts, we find a deacon called Philip. And Philip went to the Samaritans who were religiously inferior and mongrels, according to the Jews. They were basically hated by the Jews. And they did, hated the Jews as well. So it, it went, you know, it was from both sides. But when Philip came, they just put out the welcome mat for Philip and the preaching of the gospel. And this in itself is a supernatural work. And we find that there was revival, suddenly just revival. People were being converted all over the place, right, left, right and center. And some were being healed and others were being delivered from evil spirits. So loads of new believers and loads of joy in that city, loads of transformations taking place. But we also know wherever God sows his true believers, Satan will eventually sow his phonies or his counterfeits. Why? Because Satan loves religion. Satan is in the religious business up to his ears. And Satan's chief weapon is false religion. The first temptation was a religious one in the book of Genesis, to be like God. And in the last book of our Bible, the book of Revelation, the Antichrist uses a religious system to promote his cause. And yes, the Bible confirms the reality of supernatural power and gives many examples of how people successfully make use of demonic power. Like, for instance, the story of Saul trying to contact the spirit of Samuel through the medium of Endor. And then, in the story of Moses, we find the Egyptian sorcerers and magicians and they were able to turn their staffs into snakes by their occultic arts. So there's no question there either. And throughout the Bible, you'll find that magicians and sorcerers are mentioned. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, didn't have much patience for magicians. And Peter the Apostle Peter didn't have much patience for magicians and sorcerers either. And God, God regards sorcery as dangerous. And in the book of Revelation, Revelation 22 verse 14 onwards, basically said that sorcerers will be excluded from his kingdom. But the good news is that there is still time to repent of this sin. Even Simon Machus was given a chance to repent. Yes, God hates sorcery, but God loves the sinner. God hates the sin, but God loves the sinner. And as Christians... We must hide sorcery in all of its forms, but we must continue to love sorcerers and never ever stop praying for their deliverance. And yet, Satan uses the tool of sorcery, and in our Bible reading, Satan used Simon Machus. So we see that the false religious system began very, very early, almost with Pentecost, 
just after 31 AD. Now, we have quite a bit about Simon Machas in church history as well. As early as 165 AD, Justin Martyr was writing about Simon Machas. And that church father, Justin Martyr, basically said that Simon was a Samaritan from the village of Gita and he practiced magic and he was empowered by demons. And by his magic, by his magic arts, Simon had managed to pull the wool over the eyes of the Samaritans for many, many, many years. And the hocus pocus loving Samaritans were falling for his sorcery. And he was amazing with PR. And although it was energized by Satan, he used it to magnify himself. And he had become an expert in the magic arts. And Simon's influence was extensive. From the smallest micros to the greatest megas believed in Simon. The people said that he is the power of God that is called great. I mean, Simon was a big shot in Samaria, a household name in the poorest and the richest homes in Samaria. Simon was not just a cheap magician pulling rabbits out of a hat or coins out of people's ears. No, he didn't do these tricks year after year after year because if he did it year after year, he won't be able to hold people's attention. Simon the magician had tapped into real supernatural demonic power. But when Philip came to town and not only preached, but performed signs by healing people and casting out demons, Simon knew that this power was real and that it was stronger than his power. And Simon was amazed. He was amazed at this. He never ever encountered something like this before. He knew it was real. He knew that he couldn't do it. And he wanted to do it. And he was dazzled by all the signs and the wonders. And here he was, trying to save face. And he knew that his livelihood and his reputation depended on his ability to perform, to perform magic tricks for the people. And he saw people coming forward to be baptized and they were transformed and they gave up their fear and their excitement about all the sorceries. And you know what? I would imagine that Philip was greatly impressed when Simon Machus came forward and said, Philip, I'd like to be baptized too, you know, because I believe. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, it was basically the time to bring in the A team or the first team. And Peter and John, they sent Peter and John, an amazing team, a formidable team. Because why? Because Jesus had given Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which meant that Peter had the privilege of opening the door of faith to others. And he opened the door to the Jews at Pentecost. And now, after Pentecost, he opened the door to the Samaritans. And later on in the book of Acts, he would open the door of faith 
to the Gentiles as well. So Peter and John were sent from the church in Jerusalem. Why? Luke does not say, that Dr. Luke does not say, but it seems that they came to see that everything is genuine. So they basically came as fruit inspectors. Now, there's a lot of funny things happening in the Bible. And this situation is one of those things. I mean, here we have John. And a few years ago, John had asked Jesus whether he could order fire to come down from heaven and annihilate the Samaritans. And here we have the same guy, John, actually laying hands on the Samaritans, blessing them. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, pre previously, he saw them as mongrels and would never before have even laid a finger, much less a hand on them. And here, he changed completely. And that, my friend, is the supernatural power of the gospel in a person's life. It transforms us. It transforms our thinking. The power of God, which created the universe and parted the sea, has been changing lives since the beginning of time. And here was a radical change in John's heart. And it was demonstrated by his decision to bless rather than to destroy. Have you experienced the radical change in your heart as well? Have your heart changed? Do your life choices and decisions demonstrate that you truly have a new heart. And my friend, I'm not asking whether you're perfect. That's not my question. I'm not asking whether you're perfect. We're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about direction here. In which direction do you face? Christ or yourself? Heaven or hell? The word of God or the world? In which direction do you face? They are mutually exclusive. And your answer will make all the difference in this world and the world to come. And the Apostle Paul wrote that if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. A new creature. The old things has passed away. And here we see that instead of John calling down literal fire from heaven to obliterate the Samaritans, John was in, fair, in effect calling down the fire of the Holy Spirit to bless the Samaritans. What a change! Giving them the power to live a transformed life just as he, John, was experiencing. And one day, while Simon was just standing around there, he saw Peter and John laying hands on people, and he was flabbergasted at the amazing transformations that took place within people. I mean, he was a magician, he was a sorcerer, and here he saw something that can really make him even greater. So he went to Peter and John and he just plunked down a little sack of gold on the table in front of the Apostle Peter. And he said to the Apostle Peter, Hey Peter, what will you take for the Holy Spirit? And if this is not enough, there's more where this come from. You can basically, you basically see Simon Machus and he says to Peter, basically, Peter, give me also this power that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon didn't say, 
Peter, I really want the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. No, that's not what he said. He, he basically said, I want this power to give this Holy Spirit to other people. You know, there are some people who want power and influence. And there are several examples still existing in churches right over the globe. And Simon, Simon Machas, reached for his wallet, literally or figuratively speaking, to give Peter nice silver coins in exchange for the ability to transmit the Holy Spirit. And yes, that's how he did life. He most probably have paid to learn his magic arts. It was like buying a franchise, you know. Simon was used to thinking in terms of the buying and selling of abilities. That's life. He simply continued to operate as he always had. In his thinking, as a magician. But the problem was that Christianity and magic are worlds apart. It's like night and day. You can't mix the two. So when he plopped the money down right there before Peter, Peter basically turned to him and Peter basically said to him, to hell with you and your money. To hell with you and your money. And sorry, my friend, this is not my words. <laughs> And this, I know, is not New Bible, but this is in the original Greek words. And that is how strong his language was. And then Peter says, your heart, Simon, is not right with God. And Peter talks about repentance and bitterness in Simon's heart. And instead of repenting, Simon said, Peter, you pray for the Lord for me. Peter, you pray for me. And when I read the story, I thought, wow. I thought, wow, this is wonderful repentance. This guy has come to his senses. Simon Machas at last got it. He is humbling himself here. And I was reminded of the book of James where the elders pray for people. And the other bits where it says that the prayers of a righteous person availeth much. And I thought, oh man, this is so good. And it sounds so good, doesn't it? It absolutely just sounds amazing. And so I just was in la la land. Very glad Simon Machus repented. Until I did some studying. And I learned that Simon Machus basically was saying in the Greek, Hey, Peter, look, if anyone is going to have to beg God, you do it for me. I don't have time. That's basically what he is saying. So, he never changes. He never changes. He doesn't accept Jesus Christ. He just doesn't get it. Even now. And he goes away, and he becomes a constant irritant to the new church that formed. And we have an example here of how near a person can be to the kingdom of God, yet just float by. A person almost persuaded by the gospel, almost. But you know what? Almost means not there yet, my friend. Simon's failure was a failure of the heart. He had believed the stuff that Philip preached, but he didn't go from his head to his heart. He had been baptized in water, and yet he was not saved. It, and that is a warning to all of us, me included. Do we trust all of the trappings of church life? without the relationship with Jesus? Do we trust in our baptism, if we are Baptist, in our church attendance, in our beautiful liturgy, 
partaking of the Lord's Holy Communion, but not having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, Nicholas Ludwig von Zindendorf, that great Moravian, once said that a grain of living faith is worth more than a pound of historic knowledge. And Martin Luther, Martin Luther said that faith, faith is a living, busy, active, mighty thing so that it is impossible for it not to do good works incessantly. And Simon Machus was almost a Christian, almost, yet Simon believed. The million dollar question is, in what did Simon believe? Did he believe in Philip's preaching? in the words of truth, or did he believe in the miracles, the signs and wonders? In what did he believe? Was Simon a professor but not a possessor of Jesus Christ? Did he have a faith that was more in his head than in his heart? Spurgeon once wrote that fish sometimes leap out of the water with great energy, and they just like fly out of the water with great energy. But looking at that, it would be foolish of us to conclude that they have left the water behind forever. <laughs> in a moment, they are swimming again. In a moment, they are back in the water. The water is still their home. They was just distracted for a moment by a fly or something else. And the Apostle Peter looked at Simon and concluded that Simon's heart is not right with God. Simon still needs to repent. Simon is still enslaved to bitterness and iniquity. Simon is still in his sin. Simon is still thinking like a sorcerer and he is not yet converted. And this is confirmed, Peter's actions is confirmed by the entire tradition of the early church fathers, people like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Jerome, etc., that, that said that Simon went, Simon went on to become a heretic and not a true Christian. The case of Simon Machus shows us again how the devil seeks to divide Christians from within. The devil's first attempt in the book of Acts was in the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. And his second attempt was to cause conflict among the widows in the local church at Jerusalem who felt that they were being neglected. And now, in the case of Simon Machus, we have another attempt to destroy the work of Jesus. The devil sows tears among the wheat in churches. And sometimes we as church people, we are just so naive, aren't we? We are just so mushy. We don't want our churches to shrink even further. And so we come up with things like, you know, Louise, even though I disagree with Simon Machus's techniques, he does draw a crowd, you know. Really? The danger of their influence is real, my friend. Jesus said that even the elect may be deceived by miracle-working false Christs. And we avoid acting like Peter in church because we are afraid of losing out on money or opposing powerful people or disturbing the peace and the unity of God. Really? My friend, these are serious cancers that can bring death to a church.
serious. May we always speak the truth and speak it in love. And may we always seek to purify the church, the bride of Christ. And sometimes our, despite, sometimes despite our best efforts, the tears in our own lives outgrow the wheat. Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. That is in 2 Colossians 13. And you know what? It's a very good thing to check yourself. See whether you are in the faith or not. This man, Simon, he had all the outward trappings. He believed. And yes, the demons also believed, and yet they were not saved. And yes, loads of people believe. Some believe in their own good works to get to heaven. So basically their belief is in themselves, not in Jesus. The central message of the Bible is that God gives eternal life to those who believe in Jesus for it. That's the central message. We must believe in a person for a promise. I'm saying it again. We must believe in a person for a promise. The person of Jesus for the promise of eternal life. Amen? Do you believe that? If you do, then you have eternal life. And when you have eternal life, your life will bear fruit. You will bear fruit. Are you bearing fruit? What type of fruit are you bearing? Hudson Taylor said, fruit bearing involves cross bearing. There are not two Jesus Christs, an easygoing one for easygoing Christians, and a suffering, toiling one for exceptional believers. There is only one Jesus Christ. Are you willing to abide in him? And thus prove abide and bear much fruit. In order to bear much fruit, my friend, you need to be born again. That is what the Bible said. You need to be born again by the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is a divine gift, my friend. It's not some power at the beck and call of wizards like Simon Machus. It cannot be earned. The gift of the Holy Spirit cannot be bought with money either. It's a grace gift. <coughs> and so, to try and buy it is a sin. Because it's part of the covenant of grace. God is not a magic genie that does what we ask of him. God is not manipulated by people. God owes us nothing. <coughs> and we can do nothing to cause God to bless us. God is sovereign. Sometimes we believe that if we follow the right formulas, for instance, pray and then just tack on the name of the Lord Jesus and say, in the name of Jesus, then God must act in the way that we desire him to act. My friend, magic focus on the right methods, techniques and formulas. Not so with Christianity. Christianity trusts in a God whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts and whose ways are beyond our comprehension. You can't buy God. You can't buy grace. It isn't for sale. It is free. It's a divine gift. But Simon wanted to be a top man in the Christian church. He really wanted that office. He wanted that office and he regarded himself as a great man. So why can't he have that office? He was fully qualified, according to himself, to be an apostle, especially over the Samaritans 
as they regarded him already as the greatest religious leader of the age. I mean, but Peter rebuked Simon and said that he was in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So Simon's heart was crooked, his heart is warped, and his thinking is twisted. Simon's desire for God might have been smothered by his own envy and pride. The Bible tells us to watch and pray, not to be deceived. We can be deceived by other people and we can be deceived by our own desires as well. Jesus said, we always need to be on the alert for deception, always. And if we become deceived, whose fault is it? Is it God's fault or is it our fault? God says, watch out. Keep your eyes peeled, man. He has shown us the way to live. He has revealed it to us. So whose fault is it if we get tripped up? We are not going to be able to accuse God of it, you know. So who is left? We are. After the resurrection of Jesus, he left us his word and his spirit. And that is our protection against the deception of Satan, against false teachers and false prophets. God's word sets us apart. And yes, that also makes us a target, but God's word also provides us with the ammunition to fight back. That is what it says in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 6. And we have been given two weapons. We have the shield of faith, because we are willing to believe. And we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is the sword of the Spirit. And that is what we fight with. And when deceptions come, we say, aha! And we just pull our swords. And we say, on guard! We can defeat you. We can make mincemeat out of you with the truth of God. And that is our protection, my friend. That is our protection. Those are the two things that will help us to make it to the kingdom of God. So if we really know the truth and we believe it and we keep it, then we will be free from the damages of deception. And here Simon, but inside Simon, was the poison of pride and envy. You know, to use an analogy, on the slope of Long's Peak in Colorado lies a whopping big tree. It was a seedling when Columbus landed on San Salvador. And so it, it was ancient. And during the course of its long life, it was struck by lightning 14 times and umpteen avalanches and storms of four centuries thundered past it. And it survived all of them, all of them. And then one day, an army of small beetles attacked the tree and just knocked it down to the ground. Basically just leveled it. How? The insects, that small insects, ate their way through the bog and bit by bit destroyed the inner strength of the tree by their tiny but continuous act attacks. A forest giant which could not be shriveled by age, which could not be demolished by lightning blasts, which could not be crushed by storms, fell at last before beetles so small that a man could, 
could crush them between his forefinger and his thumb. And my friend, this story should serve as a warning to us. Most of us, as we are listening to the word of God, most of us can survive times of crisis. We just muster up the strength of faith or courage or determination for most of our battles, isn't it? And we face our battles head on. Whether it's in our professional or personal lives, we often overcome great obstacles. But it's the small things like pride and envy that eats us from the inside. And those are the things that lead to our downfall, just as it led to the downfall of Simon Machus. And yes, my friend, in our lives, there always will be someone better than us, according to us. There will always be someone more glitzy than you. There will always be someone smarter, sharper, more on the ball, richer, younger than you. But there will never be another you. Never. So be real. Be true to who you are created to be. God created only one of you. And as a Christian, you are sealed with God's Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 says that your body is a sacred place because it is the place of the Holy Spirit. So God owns you lock, stock and barrel and His Spirit, His Holy Spirit lives within you as a Christian. So at the same time that you were bought with a price by the Lord Jesus Christ, you obtained the Holy Spirit of God in the same context, the same time you came to Christ. Amen. And maybe you say, okay, Louise, so why didn't these Samaritans got the Spirit then immediately when they became Christians? But remember, for 500 years, the temple at Jerusalem and the temple at Gerizim had been at odds with each other. They were competitors. The Samaritans worshipped at Gerizim, the Jews worshipped at Jerusalem. And they each had their own thing, so to speak. And they hated each other. And if the Spirit of God had fallen immediately on the Samaritan believers when they received Jesus through Philip, there would have been no connection between the Samaritans and the people in the Jerusalem church. Are you with me? Therefore, this division of faction would have been kept alive in the hearts and the minds of the people. They would have said, you've got your deal, we've got ours. But that is not how it worked. Because the Lord Jesus prayed and he said, Father, I pray that they may be one. And God answered that prayer by holding back the coming of the Spirit of God until the apostles from the Jerusalem church could arrive and allow the Holy Spirit of God to come to the Samaritans by the laying on of their hands. And so nationalism is being overcome by the Holy Spirit. And there was unity in the church. And yes, there were signs and wonders. And it was amazing. And it still dazzles us even to this day, isn't it? But signs and wonders do not save. They do not transform the heart. Signs and wonders can even be imitated by Satan, like I said in the beginning of my sermon. But what changes the heart and saves the soul is the gospel and the Holy Spirit. So yes, signs and wonders can't save the soul, but they can shatter the shell of indifference. They can shatter the shell of skepticism and doubt. 
they can shatter the shell of false religion. Therefore, the early church wanted signs and wonders to be done in the name of Jesus. And spiritual gifts and signs and wonders will continue until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit changes our hearts and help us to pull out the weeds in our hearts through repentance and then plant flowers. So the Holy Spirit of God is like a gardener in our souls. God shakes things a bit up in our lives. And they pl pl uh, plant pink snapdragons and yellow and orange marigolds in our hearts, making us beautiful from the inside out. And the Holy Spirit help us to weed out the negative and replace it with the beautiful and the divine so that we can eventually be ready to live with God Almighty. Amen. And yes, this gift of the Holy Spirit is the most wonderful gift we could ever receive. But on top of that, God also gives us other gifts to enrich our lives. The Holy Spirit is like a pair of new glasses. He can help us see life through a spiritual filter. Our natural man eyes are fuzzy. And it can only see what our limited and imperfect experiences shows us. If we allow the Holy Spirit to help us to see things as they really are, then we will be able to see people and situations as God sees them. And if we can do that, we will end up being much more merciful, loving and patient with other people, much more. When we look with God's eyes, we will see with more compassion. We will see potential and hope. We will have more love for God, for other people and for ourselves. Martin Luther, and I'm finishing off, Martin Luther once had a dream where he was in, the, in his house and he saw Jesus coming up to his front door. Jesus opening his, the, the front gate and coming up to his front door. And Martin Luther just looked around and he knew that his house was in a mess. Clothes were thrown over the furniture. Old food was all over the tables. And trash was everywhere. And he thought, oh goodness. How am I going to let the Lord come into a mess like this? How can I open that front door? And he scrambled around trying to clean the things up. But the more he picked up, the greater the mess became. And finally Jesus was knocking at the door. Luther finally thrown in the towel. He looked at the mess and this, as he opened the door, he said, okay, Jesus, come on in. If you think that you can come into a place like this, come on in. And then as Martin Luther turned around, he saw that everything had been put into order. Everything was in its proper place. The house was immaculate as Jesus entered it. My friend, I don't know about you, but I know that I have this horrible tendency of making a mess out of my life. I've done it for years. And the more I try to straighten it out, the bigger mess I create. But if you will submit to Jesus, if you open your heart to him, he will make you squeaky clean, cleansing you from sin and giving you the Holy Spirit to comfort you, to guide you and establish you as a new creature. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us everything he promised and that he has purchased us to be his people, his own people. And if you want to have this gift that the Samaritans received and that Simon Machus craved, start today 
taking baby steps toward God and be open to what God says. A guy once said, if you want to shoot ducks, you have to go where the ducks are. <laughs> so my friend, if you want to build a relationship with God, you have to go to where God is and place yourself in his presence, figuratively speaking, because God's everywhere we know, but you need to make time with him. Seek the kingdom of God. Place yourself in God's presence. Only in that way can you receive the gifts he wants you to have. And he will bless you with his presence. Amen. My God bless you. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Father God, thank you that we could learn more about you today, that we could learn that we need to look at ourselves and that we need to seek you and we need to be on the alert not to be deceived. So, Father, we place our lives in your hands and we ask that you will renew us, that you will take out as hearts of stones and give us hearts of flesh, that you will make us more and more into your image so that we will spread the sweet fragrance of the Lord Jesus Christ wherever we go. So may the Lord our God be with you. May he bless you. May his presence go with you 24-7. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.